This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Imbue Jewelry. Imbue is a jewelry workshop in Port Townsend, Washington, where you can make a piece of jewelry with your own hands and imbue it with your own personal meaning, memory, intention, or spell. This is a one-day workshop with a professional jeweler where you will use a torch and jeweler's tools to create your own piece. Common types of jewelry created are amulets and talismans to invoke power and offer protection, pieces to mark milestones, transitions, or personal lineage, daily ritual reminders, and more. The metals and gemstones used are ethically sourced, and you are welcome to include your own found objects. Learn more at imbuejewelrystudio.com and on Instagram at imbuejewelrystudio, and imbue is spelled I, M as in magic, B-U-E. And if you mention the Witch Wave podcast when you book your workshop, you'll get 13% off. So check out Imbue Jewelry Studio. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by UBU Skills. Curious about shadow work but don't know where to start? Seeking a fresh outlook with new eyes? Megan Hamilton is a speaking, visibility, and confidence coach and tarot reader, and she's put together a free workbook called Me and My Shadow. Best-selling author and TEDx speaker Jericho Mandiber calls it, quote, an equal parts raw roadmap, and a warm hug. This is the perfect entry point into the magical and revealing world of shadow work. Unquote. Grab your copy at ubuskills.com slash witchwave. That's the letter U, the letter B, the letter U, skills.com slash witchwave. And find out how witchwave listeners can work with Megan at 10% off. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Midge Blitz. Midge Blitz is a Jersey City-based one-woman-run shop and is exactly what you'd expect the brainchild of a loud witch from New Jersey to look like. Oh, I am here for a loud witch from New Jersey. You all know this. Catering to all the punks, witches, and queers alike, she designs weird and witchy handmade accessories, as well as screen-printed apparel and totes, all in her home studio that have a general theme of show em who's boss. Her most popular designs include things that say, all of us feminist witches, Hex all fascists and be gay, do witchcraft, to name just a few. Slogans like that pair well with her many accessories, including buttons, hand illustrated brooches, patches, keychains, and her favorite, hoop earrings with eye charms hanging off of them. And you, Lucky Witch Wave listener, can get 15% off at her website, shopmidgeblitz.com, by using offer code WITCHWAVESENTME. That's shop, M as in magic, I-D-G-E-B-L-I-T-Z dot com, and use offer code WITCHWAVESENTME. The world is filled with bewitching people, and you might be one too. Welcome to the podcast where art is magic, magic is real, and reality is stranger than dreams. I'm Pam Grossman, and this is The Witch Wave. Hello and welcome to the Witch Wave. Ooh, spring is springing. I'm recording this from our little house in the mountains of upstate New York, and the daffodils are daffodilly dallying, and our star magnolia tree is popping off. I love this time of year for reasons both natural and supernatural. Because we're about to enter Taurus season. And 
This is said to be a time of pleasure and luxury and sensuality, as well as there being two deeply magical holy days on the pagan wheel coming up. And of course, I am talking about Hexenacht or Walpurgis Night, most commonly known as Witches Night, which takes place on April 30th. And this is the night before Beltane. And it's a holiday of flowers and fire and fertility and fairies and fucking, if you so choose. It's also a personally meaningful holiday for me because Matt proposed to me on May 1st of 2010, and he didn't even know it was Beltane, so it was just beyond beautiful. Now, to help you celebrate all of this spring magic, I've got a couple of online events coming up. On this coming Thursday, April 20th, I will be leading our Patreon circle for Taurus season, and this month's theme is all about earth magic. So if you're already a Witchwave Patreon member, this is a free offering for you, and if you can't make it live, the recording will be available until next month's Patreon circle. Now, if you haven't joined our Patreon yet... What are you waiting for? It really is such an incredible and magical community. And then for everyone, Patreon member or not, on Sunday, April 30th, Jonica Stuckey and I are offering an online Witches' Night workshop to help you honor your inner witch and ready yourselves for Hexenacht and Beltane. And tickets are on sale now via the link in my bio at my Phantasmophile Instagram page and on my website at pamgrossman.com slash events. I really hope to see you at one or dare I say both of these online offerings. They are going to be supremely scrumptious and I am incredibly excited for them. Now, because we're about to enter Taurus season, I've got the body on my mind. (laughs) That turn of phrase makes me laugh. But witchcraft, as I am very fond of saying, is an embodied practice. It's a practice of generating energy and feeling sensation and deepening our connection to the world around us, as much as it is also about the spirit and visualization and manifestation and all of those other good things. And being in my body and taking care of my body hasn't always come naturally to me and it still doesn't. I have zero earth in my astrological chart, okay? I am very airy and very watery. And so I've had to make a concerted effort to ground to nourish, to pay attention to my physicality as much as I do to my thoughts and my emotions. And a big piece of this for me has not only been about trying to spend more time in nature and feed myself well and get exercise, but also in realizing that mind, spirit, and body are not these separate entities that need to be addressed individually but rather that by addressing and taking care of my body, I am also simultaneously taking care of my spirit and my mind. And when I do this, when I take this approach, I feel better. I'm healthier physically, but that increases my vitality and lowers my stress and makes my magic feel steadier and stronger and brighter. And as I've gotten older, I've come to really value teachers and witches and therapists, oh my, who have this more integrated approach. I have a therapist now who is a practicing Buddhist. And so in addition to a lot of the talk therapy that we do together, she also provides me with meditations and exercises to help me regulate my entire system and calm my body down. 
Because as we know, the stress and trauma that we carry with us affects us physically and vice versa. So I've been trying to be a better friend to and caretaker of my body and to try to approach my healing, my strength, my health, my magic as all part of one system. And so over the pandemic, when I started to get request after request after request from several of you darling listeners for me to have a witchy therapist on the show. I knew that I wanted to feature someone who approached therapy from an emotional perspective, yes, from a spiritual perspective, yes, but also from an embodied perspective, yes, yes, yes. And I could think of no better person than today's guest, Andrea Gutierrez Glick, whose Instagram handle for her very popular account is Somatic Witch. On this episode, Andrea and I talk all about how to help heal our own stress and trauma in ways that honor our entire system, including our magnificent magical bodies. And this conversation is so timely and so inspiring and so useful, and I can't wait for you to hear it. But before we get to that, first, let's check and see what's come through on the witch wire who is it witches amanda writes i'm writing because i've been experiencing a bit of a dilemma lately in regard to spell work i've dabbled a little in candle magic and have found it a helpful way to ground and meditate however lately i've been wanting to add a bit more of specific intention to my spells or spiritual time as i call it But I'm realizing that I'm a bit apprehensive to add any of my desires. First, because I'm just a bit scared that I will unintentionally mess with the ominous plans of the universe like a butterfly effect scenario. Second, I'm having a hard time even knowing what I want. I want what's best for me and what's best for others. And I keep thinking, well, I can't even know what's best with my limited human insight. There's also a part of me that feels selfish for asking for something specific. I should have mentioned that I am the typical indecisive Libra with anxiety. I also have a history of religious trauma, so I'm sure that is playing into things too. I'd treasure your advice on ways to come up with a clear intention, as well as your thoughts on being apprehensive to disrupt the plans of the cosmos and the gods and the guides. Thank you. Hello, Amanda. Well, this is a multi-pronged question, so I'm going to do my best to answer it as best as I can, but also as succinctly as I can. And I do want to acknowledge that we've gotten similar questions like this over the years, but I feel called to answer this again. Now, something I've learned about anxiety as someone who lives with anxiety myself is that it is as much a physical experience as it is a mental one. And I talk about this very thing in much depth with today's guest, so make sure you listen to the whole episode, but I'll just say briefly here for now that if you can get out of your head when you find yourself sort of worrying and catastrophizing and focus on your body, it can help, if not eradicate, the anxiety altogether in that moment or at least bring it down from a boil to a simmer. So before doing any sort of spell work, you can do the things you do to prepare by casting your circle or lighting your candle. But I also really recommend taking big, deep breaths. Maybe even meditating for a few minutes. If you can take a cleansing ritual bath or shower, that will also help shift your energy and help 
calm your body down. And this can be immensely effective too. If you've taken any workshops with me or done any rituals with me online or in person, you know that I always have us start by doing some deep breathing and taking a smoke bath with incense before we even call circle. This is to center us and to focus us but it's also to quiet down all of the buzzing that is happening in a lot of our heads all the time thanks to the pace and stress of this world that we're living in right now. So yeah, that's my first piece of advice. Incorporate physio-magical techniques into your spell work. The second piece of advice is to address your wider question, which has come up before on this show. So you are not alone. A lot of folks share this worry that you have, that they're going to somehow fuck up their spell by asking for the wrong thing or doing it the wrong way. And I just want to remind you about intention, intention, intention. If you set an intention before your spell that is for the spell to bring about the greatest good or to be in service of love or some variation of this kind of language... This is a signal to spirit that you trust and surrender to something greater than yourself. And so it can take over. And if you then ask for something that you are hoping to manifest, you can also end with the words, or something even better which will help me serve the greatest good. This is also why I usually tend to focus my spell work not on an exact request or a specific request, but rather on a broader intention or a series of broader intentions. So this came up recently with a listener who was asking about trying to manifest a specific job and then she got the job she thought she wanted and it ended up making her miserable. And I told her, If she instead now tries to manifest a job that will make her feel a certain way or will help her do certain things or will allow for certain events to happen in her life, then she can let go of being focused on what exactly that job will be. Let spirit come up with the solution, okay? So when we were looking to buy a house a couple years ago, we saw a ton of houses that looked awesome. And some of them were really beautiful, and some of them I really wanted. But I didn't cast a spell about one of those specific houses because I just didn't know just because a house seems amazing if it was the right house for us. Instead, I cast a spell to help us find a house that was quiet and safe and warm and had enough rooms for guests both near nature and near a little town so we weren't totally isolated and had a bathtub because that's very important to me and a whole list of other qualities and features and intentions that I and Matt had for this house okay and I cast this spell And then the house that we ended up with, the house that I'm recording this from right now, I'm going to be really honest with you. It's different than what I pictured. And so I might have overlooked this house or passed it by if I was only focused on some of the houses that looked a little flashier or seemed a little overtly witchy. But this house has ended up being so special and has great energy and has brought us a lot of joy and a lot of the things that we wanted and needed. And you know what? I've brought more flash and witchiness to it myself. So the house and I are having a pretty great relationship so far. So that's just a taste of my general approach to spell casting these days, and it's been really effective for me and has also helped me with some of my anxiety over being ultra specific about what I'm asking for. Because you're right, we don't always know exactly what the best solution is, but spirit always does. So I think that this approach can really help you too, 
and I would love to hear about any experiences that you have with it. Thank you so much for your question and keep me posted. Now on to my guest. Andrea Gutierrez Glick is a therapist who specializes in treating trauma, PTSD, and CPTSD for women and queer and trans folks using EMDR, IFS, and feminist therapy practices to help clients come home to themselves. She began as a crisis counselor at a peer-led grassroots organization and quickly found her calling, going on to serve at many organizations and nonprofits that provide therapeutic services for women and LGBTQ folks. Over the years, Andrea has been able to serve the LGBTQ plus feminist sex worker and survivor community in many capacities as a trauma therapist, sex educator, facilitator, intake coordinator, and community organizer, and more recently, a career coach. Andrea received her LMSW in 2017 from Hunter College School of Social Work and her LCSW in 2020. In 2023, she became certified in EMDR. Her ultra-popular Instagram account, at Somatic Witch, also provides followers with advice and insights around integrated healing. She is proud to be an out queer lesbian therapist and currently lives and practices on occupied Osage, Sioux, Kaskaskia, and Kickapoo land at the confluence of the Missouri, Mississippi, and Illinois rivers. She sees clients in St. Louis, Missouri at Empowered Spaces. Andrea joined me from her home in St. Louis via Zoom. Andrea Gutierrez Glick, welcome to The Witch Wave. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to have you. I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time. And in fact, a lot of my listeners have been asking me to have a therapist on the show, I think because everyone's very stressed out right now. So doubly, doubly excited to have you for that reason. So why don't we start by talking a little bit about your doorway into therapy or your angle of therapy. You call yourself on Instagram a somatic witch. And I'd love to hear about that terminology and any other just sort of level setting or terms that you'd love to define your type of work with. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely feel that therapy is very spiritual. I don't have a particular spiritual lens at which I look through it with, but it's such a vulnerable and emotional and sometimes very mysterious process. And so I've always felt that there was something else kind of happening. And the term, which to me also honors the way that the body is incorporated into the types of therapy that I do, which I think is anything very embodied. I think anything embodied is very witchy. So, and just generally, I think it speaks to the folks that I work with who are queer and trans and more politically radical and more interested in other types of spiritual practices or belief systems. So I think it speaks to both the work who I work with and then me as just kind of a person Being Jewish, I see myself as being from this long lineage of witchcraft because that is often what our spiritual and cultural practices have been called. And there's a lot in Judaism that is very witchy. Fuck right. (laughs) Yeah, that's sort of my connection to the term. And then also I'm a third generation therapist. And so I see it as this like long lineage of women healers in my family who do this work, which has always felt kind of witchy to me as well. Wow. How incredible. Now the word somatic, I'm familiar with it, but I'd love to hear your definition just so our listeners know what we're talking about. Yeah, definitely. Soma means of the body. So it's really just incorporating our physical bodies into our healing, which I think is always happening anyways, even if we're not naming it, even in talk therapy, but types of therapy that get the body a little bit more central to the work, I think help people connect to their feelings, 
to the physical sensations that they often have taught themselves not to listen to because who benefits for us to be disconnected from our bodies, right? Those in power and those that profit deeply from capitalism. Mm -hmm. So if we're listening and we're going to hear something is really wrong, whether it be with society, the world, what's happened to us. And so for a lot of trauma survivors, which is a huge, huge part of the folks that I work with, they've really had to learn to ignore their bodies just to get through life. And that's both from being in communities that are more marginalized and then also just having experienced trauma. And so much of what trauma does is take us outside of our bodies as a way to get through it. Mm. So somatic or somatic therapy really helps us reconnect with our bodies after trauma, or even just generally speaking, connect with our bodies in a society that really doesn't give us a lot of opportunities to do that and really doesn't even want us to do that. So when you're talking about incorporating the body into therapy, I know there are so many different modalities for that. And there are literal body workers who will like touch your body as you're talking, whether that's like in Reiki or other kinds of energy work. My understanding is that's not necessarily what you're doing. You're not necessarily touching other people. It's more about teaching them new I don't know, skills or tools to be more embodied in their own life. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. It's definitely not touch in my practice, but it is getting the body on board with the processing of trauma. So I do EMDR, eye movement re desensitization and reprocessing, which uses bilateral stimulation of the body to process trauma and really focuses on our brain's inherent desire and capacity to process trauma and make it part of our story versus at the front of our brains all the time. So that type of therapy, the way that it incorporates the body is we're not just talking about what happened to us. We are letting our body's natural somatic processes of healing and meaning making happen. It's a lot slower than just the the, 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 the talking. So really like slows folks down And then the first phase of any trauma treatment is going to be stabilization. So you're not going to walk into hopefully a new therapeutic relationship and go straight for the worst thing that's ever happened to you. You're going to spend time figuring out how is my body responding to stress and trauma? Maybe it's through dissociation, maybe it's through anxiety, maybe it's through substance use. And what are some other ways that I can support my body in feeling safe in the here and now? That maybe helped me feel more connected to other people, more connected to my authenticity. So there's definitely like one in a million skills that you can teach a person. But in my opinion, people just need a couple of either new tools or to really zone in on what they're already doing that's aligned with who they are as a person versus the ways that we learn to adapt with our society and really helping them create more space to use those resources that they already have instead of the bottle of wine or scrolling on TikTok for three hours. Mm -hmm. So that's really the first phase is helping our nervous system feel safer in the here and now through new tools or what we're already using so that deeper trauma work can happen. And we're going to have the tools to manage some of the intense feelings that come up. Mm. I'm so happy that you talked about how witchcraft is an embodied practice and what kind of therapy you do is an embodied practice. I want to just make sure that our listeners are aware that I'm not saying that witchcraft is therapy. I absolutely do not believe that. I think it can be therapeutic. I've been in therapy for most of my life. It is very much complementary to witchcraft, I would say, but I don't think either is a replacement for. So I just want to be clear. But I really appreciate the lines you're drawing between them because both of them are very embodied practices. And I was reading through your blog. You have some really beautiful articles that you've written. And you talk about the difference between, and this was the first time I've heard these phrases. Well, I've heard the phrase triggers but you talk about another phrase, which is glimmers. Mm -hmm. And I would love for you to tell us what glimmers are versus triggers, because it's such a magical word. And my body really responded to that article that you wrote in that terminology. For sure. Instead of teaching people a million new somatic skills, helping them see what they already have or what they already do as being something that they can use to regulate their nervous system, 
or feel more connected to themselves. A glimmer is an opposite, is what, whatever the opposite of a trigger is. So if a trigger triggers you into a trauma response, a glimmer is going to glimmer you into feeling safe and like you connect with other people. The term was kind of made up or coined by Deb Dana, who's a fantastic trauma therapist. And the glimmers that my clients usually have a list of, again, are things that they already have a connection to. So it could be tarot cards. It could be the smell of lavender. It could be being outdoors, their animal, their partner, a cozy blanket, anything like that. And so it's something that really helps their nervous system feel more regulated and more grounded. And it's important that we have a clear sense or what are those things that are going to bring us back to safety so that when we do experience a trigger or a lot of stress, we have a way to sort of come back to ourselves. Again, that isn't something like drinking or scrolling. Not that there's anything wrong with using those when we're in a lot of distress or that you're a bad person if you do those things. Or just for fun. Yeah. But I haven't met somebody who's like, no, I feel really good about the fact that when I'm upset, I drink. You know, most people are like, I would like to have other things because this doesn't help me feel more connected to myself or this doesn't help me feel like I'm really sitting in my authenticity. So glimmers, I think, are ways that we can really feel grounded and present versus a little bit more in our window of tolerance, but also kind of checked out. Interesting. And I'm just tracking for myself, not to make you my spontaneous (laughs) therapist and my non-consensual therapist, but I'm realizing that when I was preparing for this conversation, I knew we were going to talk about trauma and we were going to talk about a lot of darkness. And I'm comfortable to a point talking about trauma and darkness. I'm a witch. I believe in shadow work. I believe in all of the gifts of darkness. But I also know that I'm someone who also likes to know that there's glimmers and hope, too. And so I really appreciate the fact that you offer this terminology for us because I think sometimes people think, okay, I'm going to do shadow work. I'm going to do trauma therapy, that it's going to be excruciating. And so they avoid doing it, maybe. And I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Yes. This is like one of my soapboxes. (laughs) If it's hard to a point of extreme distress or it's excruciating or it's painful, it's not happening correctly. And that is whether you're, you know, doing witchcraft, whether you're in therapy, like I see so much in my practice, clients who are really curious about something like EMDR, trauma reprocessing, and have all of these parts of them, all these protective parts that avoid that work, like the plague. And that is totally fine. And I never want to bulldoze past that protective response. But when we're able to just do it for like 10 minutes, people are like, wait, that's it. I'm like, yeah, that's it. And when you do get overwhelmed, which will happen eventually, we will stop and we will use your glimmers. We will use all of the tools that we've worked on. We should never be outside of our, again, what's called the window of tolerance when we're doing intense work. We should be connected to our feelings but it should never be intolerable. That is actually re-traumatizing for our body. I think that's a big, a really, really big misunderstanding. One that I even had when I was choosing what types of therapies to get trained in, I avoided EMDR for a long time because I thought it was just this really heavy, intense work. And to me, it's actually the most gentle and I would say compassionate and slow way of doing really, really deep work. But that is kind of across the board. Um, a big misunderstanding that I think people have about trauma work. Yes. I've actually had a limited amount of experience with EMDR. I've had so many therapists at this point, but like (laughs) I had a therapist many moons ago. She was fabulous and also such a character. She was in her 80s and like (laughs) such a character. And I came into therapy one day. This is probably 15 years ago now. But she had a disc man waiting for me on a chair. And even back then, a disc man was like a very old tech. But my 85-year-old therapist is like, oh, here's a disc man for you. And so this was more of like a sound-based EMDR, which I found really interesting. And there were different beeps happening in my ears as I was kind of retelling these stories of trauma that I've lived through. And it was pretty amazing. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about how stimulating both sides of your brain, I guess, or your body helps you metabolize some of this trauma. Yeah. And you're going to love this, Pam, because this is really witchy and it's highly clinically tested and evidence-based. So it's one of those things where it's like, it just does work, you know? So 
the woman who created EMDR, she was taking a walk and was like thinking through something upsetting that had happened to her. And she was watching the birds in, I think it was like in Central Park and was noticing that her eyes were moving back and forth really rapidly as she watched the birds and then was experiencing a lot less distress and overwhelm with the memory that she was working on. So she was sort of curious, like, "Hmm, I wonder if there's something to this like back and forth of the eyes that is regulating for the body or that stimulates something in the brain. And her name was Francine Shapiro, perhaps another Jewish witch, right? (laughs) Hell yes! Jewish witch healers in the house. (laughs) Yeah. So she started using the back and forth eye movements with her clients. And there's so much more to EMDR than that. So I never want to say like, it's just that. But this bilateral stimulation of the body, whether it's your eyes moving back and forth, whether it's hearing a sound on the right side and then the left side, Some clients really like to tap, whether it's on their shoulders or on their knees. You can also hold these buzzers that buzz back and forth. So it's just like the back and forth on the body, which can happen in so many ways. I've gotten to do the bilateral stimulation with clients holding their animals that they'll bring into my office. So getting their dog back and forth. Yeah, there's like a lot of beautiful ways. A colleague of mine is getting trained in using EMDR with horses and clients, which is super, super cool. Again, wishy, wishy, wishy. (laughs) Oh, this is so amazing. It makes me wonder, and perhaps you don't know the answer to this, but like a lot of times to soothe myself, I sort of sway or rock and dancing I find really soothing. I wonder Mm -hmm. if it's working on similar principles. Yeah. And walking is that back and forth. You know, it doesn't surprise me that Francine Shapiro was watching nature when she first experienced the sort of relief from her trauma memory. And I think there's so much when we're in connection with the earth, which again, very witchy, Mm -hmm. our body is getting stimulated in different ways. We can come up with a million theories, but all we need to know is that lots and lots and lots of clinical studies have been done on all different types of people who have all different types of mental health issues. And it's proven to be extremely helpful in the brain rewiring towards more adaptive connections about trauma. So something about the back and forth stimulation helps us make new connections, let go of old beliefs. It helps us feel less distressed about certain trauma details. So when you're using the back and forth bilateral stimulation, clients are kind of taking a drive through their mind. The target part that we're working with, whether it's a part of themselves or target memory is kind of the beginning of the drive or the trailhead. And then they just kind of free associate through that target that we're starting with. So they're not telling me the full story like a book. They're Mm -hmm. just kind of taking me through where their brain is going. If their brain is making boop, 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 all these different connections as they're watching the light move or as they're tapping And then when I stop the stimulation, then they'll kind of report back on the associations that they've made, what they're thinking of, what's happening in their body. It's so cool. Oh, this is so awesome. On that note, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Have you tried setting goals and intentions in your witchcraft practice, but they never seem to work out? Or maybe you just don't know where to start. Lilith Amberley, a witch with more than a decade of experience and host of the podcast, Not Your Daughter's Witchcraft, is holding a free workshop where you'll learn her method of setting intentions to help you start living the life that you want to live. Join Lilith for a free 45-minute live virtual workshop on April 21st called Setting Intentions That Work. Registrants will receive a free recording of the workshop, even if they can't attend the live session. Spots are limited and reservations are required, so secure yours today at witchlifeacademy.lilithamberley.com slash workshop. That's witchlifeacademy.lilith. A Amazon Magic B E R L Y dot com slash workshop. And if you're looking for more, Lilith's brand new four week online course, Jumpstart Your Magical Practice, begins on May 1st. This course is meant to help the beginner witch start building a magical practice that works for them. You'll be getting Four weekly modules, videos, a workbook, weekly Q&A, personalized feedback, and free access to her mini course, Moon Magic. 
To learn more and get signed up today, go to witchlifeacademy.lilithamberly.com slash get started. Doors for these classes close soon, so don't wait. The Witch Wave is sponsored by BetterHelp. So I am always striving to grow and learn new things, and I'm always trying to think about how I can keep my work exciting for me and for you all. I love doing this podcast. I love writing. I love doing all the different projects that I do, but I'm always looking to expand and figure out what's next. How can I add to what I'm doing? How can I offer more? How can I keep myself and all of my wonderful listeners and readers and students students engaged in what I'm doing too. And a lot of this requires a great deal of introspection. And getting to know oneself can be a lifelong process. I'm a very introspective person. And therapy has been a huge tool in my toolkit to help me with this introspection. Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we react the way we do until we talk through things with somebody else. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. And I've been in therapy on and off since I was 14 years old. I'm in my early 40s now, so that's a long time. And it has helped me so much at every step of my journey to help figure out who I am, what can I offer, what is next. And a lot of what I talk about with my current therapist is actually around my creativity and how I can keep growing and evolving in a sustainable way. Therapy has been helpful for me in learning positive coping skills for when those times get stressful. It's helped me learn to set boundaries, and it's empowered me to be the best version of myself. It's not just for those of us who've experienced major trauma or major rifts in our lives. Therapy is also beneficial to help us figure out how can I navigate my life in a way that's the most prosperous and healthy and joyful so I can keep going and keep growing. So if you're thinking about starting therapy yourself, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. And all you have to do to get started is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Visit betterhelp.com slash witchwave today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash witchwave. Hi, witch wavers. I have exciting news. At long last, we have some new witch wave merch available for you now through T Public. We decided to go with TeePublic for our new Witchwave merch because it is a print-on-demand site, which means you can get different variations of the Witchwave logo printed on t-shirts, mugs, totes, stickers, magnets, notebooks, oh my gods, the sky's the limit. And the shirts come in different styles and fabrics and colors and are available in sizes small through 5XL, so you can order whatever you'll feel you're most magical in. So head on over to witchwavepodcast.com slash shop. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with Andrea Gutierrez Glick. So you brought up a few moments ago the idea that nature is incredibly therapeutic. And I'd love to dive into that a little bit more. I think listeners are probably familiar with the concept of Shinrin Yoku, which is this Japanese phrase, which means forest bathing. And it's this idea that if you're like walking under trees, you actually feel better because trees literally emit some kind of chemical. It's not just oxygen. There's other kinds of chemicals that calm the body down. We have this very interrelated relationship with nature. And I would love to hear you expand upon why nature can be so healing or spending time with nature can be so healing. 
And not just for people who live by the ocean. It can be accessed at any time in any place, right? Yeah, absolutely. We're biologically meant to be in relationship with the earth. And I think so much of what we see getting built, whether it's, you know, forest bathing retreats or this kind of cabin is really just a way of trying to get people back to what was every day. And for so many people in the world and everywhere is just existence. It's just like every day I'm outside for eight hours or every day I'm outside for at least a couple of hours. And some of us, you know, who live in bigger cities have to go on said retreat in order to be in that place. But it is really why I think so many people feel stressed and dysregulated there's lots of reasons, but one of them is definitely that we're not in environments that we're sort of meant or designed to be in, i.e. nature. And when we are in nature, we are outdoors of any type. We're not maybe even there. We're like walking to the train or on our phone, or we're not being mindful and curious about the trees, the plants, the birds that are around us. So I definitely see nature as a huge resource for healing and honestly just connecting with our humanity. And then of course, there's also the more spiritual component, following the moon, following the seasons. These are practices that most of our ancestors had for thousands of years. So when we get back to that, there's also that personal connection to whatever your lineage is, being able to locate what your great grandparents, your great, great grandparents, so on and so forth, did to feel connected to the world around them. Absolutely. Something that's coming up for me right now is I get this question a lot from my listeners and readers, and I try to answer them as best as I can, but I have a real expert here, so I'm going to shoot this question your way, which is, you know, a lot of people are living with anxiety. I'm someone who has to pretty actively manage my anxiety. Thanks, intergenerational trauma from our (laughs) Jewish genes, right? Which I want to talk about that too, but a lot of folks ask me, how do I know if a feeling that I'm getting is intuition warning me, at which is really helpful, versus yeah. anxiety, which is fear-based and which maybe had a helpful root, but is not actually helpful in this situation. And usually when they're asking me this question, it's about doing a spell or, you know, doing something magical where they're like, well, if I get uh, like a negative feeling, Is that intuition or is it just my own anxiety? And I just wondered what that might bring up for you. Yeah, I would be so curious what part of themselves is bringing the intuition forward. So when they get that feeling in their body or when they hear that voice, that's like, oh, I wouldn't do that. What's the image that goes with that voice or what part of themselves kind of lives in that part of their body? So for example, if it's like, if I feel it in my gut, it's real and I need to listen If I feel it in my chest, I know it's my anxiety part and I don't really need to listen to her right now. I can let her know, thank you. Thank you for worrying about me, but I am going to move forward with this because this other part of me, my connection to myself, my core self is telling me that it's okay. So I think like being curious about where it's coming from both physically and then also is the words that that warning is using, are those words that your core or authentic self likes to use or are those words that might be more connected to an anxiety or even more of a legacy burden from past generations. Like I often experience fears that are not grounded in my lived reality. I am generally safe on a daily basis. That's because of privilege. That's also because my ancestors got my lineage out of an unsafe situation and to a more safe situation. So when I get messages about life or death, sometimes I need to sit with that and say, is that me or is that my grandma? Is that me or is that my great grandfather? Like, where is this coming from? Is it a response in my body that's very old and is not mine? Or is it something that is really reflective of my current situation? Mm. And something I think about a lot too is like, is anxiety something that one has to accept about oneself? And I've heard so many different theories You know, something that we talk a lot about on the podcast, just because I love it so much, is this idea, it's very Buddhist, called having tea with your demons. This idea that like when these fears come up, instead of just trying to like bat them away to like give them a little bit of time and space and say thanks for sharing and kind of befriend them as opposed to trying to squelch them. But in my own life, I'm always like, 
is there a version of myself where I'm just like not anxious anymore? Or is this just who I fucking am? You know what I mean? And I'd be so curious what you think about that. I know that's such a big question, but. (laughs) (laughs) This is where I, I love to get into genetics, which is that anxiety is one of the most inheritable you know, the gene that holds those traits, it's very inheritable. It has like something like a 30 or 40% inheritability rate. So there we go. (laughs) There There it is. But there's also the nurture aspect. So it's definitely genetic. It's definitely the conditions of the world that we live in. It could be personal experiences that someone or you has had. It could be adaptations to the environment to your parents, right? I have to be kind of vigilant or on guard in this way to make my parents happy or keep myself safe from my family or in the world. So it's all of those things at the same time. If someone's ever like, it's just genetic, or it's just because of your childhood, or, you know, all those things, it's like, well, it's probably a lot more complicated than that. It's probably all of the above. So that's why medication is helpful for people. It really helps with that genetic factor. And that's also why therapy is really helpful because it does help us unlearn some of what we've maybe taken on in childhood or in life for that trait that we already have to really get bigger and take up a lot more space. But that compassion for that part of ourselves, just as you were saying, having tea with them, loving on them. You know, I deal with anxiety and OCD and that really emerged in my life when I was 10. And so I would never tell my 10 year old self go away, right? Mm -hmm. Like I want to love on her. I want to hold space for her. It's a lot more helpful (laughs) to just sort of tap into that self-compassion and love Even imagining that part of yourself as a younger self is really useful. Something else I found so useful is an image that you shared on your Instagram feed. It's a diagram that I believe you got from Magdalena Weinstein, Mm -hmm. and it shows these concentric circles showing different kinds of trauma. And I think this feels relevant to the point you were just making about how there's so many different factors. So the three circles, there's developmental trauma, transgenerational trauma, and systemic trauma. And I'd love for you to talk about each of those. Yeah, absolutely. I've heard a lot of criticisms of the current way that trauma therapy is existing where it's like, well, if we just call everything trauma, then nothing is trauma. And, you know, it could be as simple as like, somebody looked at me the wrong way and now I'm traumatized. And I'm always like, that's really not helpful. <laughs> Let me just say, all right, I'm happy we're on the same page here because I love therapy. It has helped me so much, but I mm-hmm. do feel like people have taken some of these words that have real meaning and then they're overusing them a little bit. Like for me, the word trigger, I'm like, that's actually a real thing. Just because something you don't like it or it makes you a little uncomfortable, that's not a fucking trigger of trauma or even the word trauma, right? Just because something makes you uncomfortable doesn't mean you're traumatized. And I believe discomfort is part of growth and being a human being. So anyway, sorry, that's my soapbox moment, I guess. Absolutely. And unfortunately, because I agree with everything you just said, who ends up using that argument, though, are people who don't want to face the lived realities of people that deal with systemic trauma. Yeah. So there's that part of it. And then there's also the part where I see a lot of folks with a lot of privilege overuse certain terms about daily life stress or things that are activating to them. So there's sort of like two camps in there. There's like yes. people who to oppress, to be like, nothing is trauma, get over it, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And then there are people with a lot of privilege who overuse these terms instead of sitting with themselves. Maybe it's dealing with their own privilege, dealing with their anxiety, you know, so sort of co-opt some trauma therapy language because that's what feels safe and comfortable for them, which I understand, but it can take power away from people who have experienced major trauma. So What I really like about that diagram is that it shows all of these different types of trauma that we can experience so that when people say, well, if trauma is everything, what is it? It's like, well, it's this, right? It's generational. It's what we carry in our bodies. It's experiences that we have that are traumatizing. And then it's also the sort of lived reality of living within white supremacy and capitalism. Mm -hmm. So it's all of those things. And typically people who have less access to resources and are not seen as human in our world, have more trauma than people who have more privilege and more access to resources. Does that mean that if you have those things, you can't be traumatized? Absolutely not. (laughs) But I think we're starting to see more of a conversation about, oh, growing up in poverty is an enormous trauma. Being scared that you're not going to be able to get your child hormones for their transition, that's actually a trauma that your family is going through versus just looking at it as, 
a political reality. It's a political reality and it's also traumatizing. Yes. Yes. Thank you. That's really, really helpful. Speaking of hormones and, you know, what's happening specifically in the LGBTQ community right now, because we have a lot of listeners who identify as queer and across the gender spectrum, there's a lot of trauma already. But this is a specifically traumatizing moment in our country with all of these anti-trans bills and anti-drag bills and book banning and don't say gay in Florida and all this terrible shit. And so I wondered if I could invite you to address any folks who are experiencing this political moment as triggering or as traumatic, and if there are things that they might be able to do if they can't see someone like yourself to try to, I don't know, ground or soothe themselves in this moment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think just that self-validation of this is a trauma that I'm going through, whether you live in a state where this impacts you or not, you're still watching other people who are like you in your community go through this. You're also like, are they going to come for me next? Just that our body is designed to keep us safe from external threats. So all of those real triggers that people are experiencing, that is their nervous system trying to keep them safe, keep them on high alert, keep them aware of what's going on. So if you feel like shit, right, if you feel scared or shut down all the time, that is your body trying to do its job. And so what do we do to not feel that way all the time? Because our bodies aren't wrong. Like, oh, it's fine. Everything's safe. It's all in my head. Like, no, this is real. But I really find that when we're able to connect with other people, be in community with other people, when we're able to experience compassion for ourselves, and when we can locate experiences of feeling free, feeling freedom in our body, freedom in our gender, freedom in whatever, that is sort of the balm to this oppression. And this is how people at the margins have survived for thousands of years, right? We have so many stories in our own lineages of communities that we belong to, of everything was on fire and we still blank, right? We still danced, we still ate, we still fucked, we still Mm -hmm. found ways to be in relationship with each other. And so that is really the answer, whether it's at a protest or it's going out to a drag night or it's going to a queer 12-step meeting or it's having, you know, a Seder with your queer chosen family, like this is the balm is being with others in community and really giving our bodies a chance to feel free versus so stuck, trapped and oppressed. You know, witchcraft is a great way to feel free. Definitely sex or movement is a great way to feel free. So if we can just sort of give our nervous system opportunities to have other types of experiences, it can kind of balance that out. This isn't, again, like a new idea. This is like how people who have experienced oppression and violence have survived. So this is what we do. Yes, yes, yes. On that note, we're going to take another quick break and we'll be right back. So by now, you know, I love Wiser Books and I'm really excited about one of their newest publications, which is called Heal the Witch Wound by Celeste Larson. Heal the Witch Wound is a book that's a practical guide for modern witches and healers full of rituals, journal prompts, visualization exercises, and other tools to overcome the witch wound, which is described as a collective, intergenerational psychic wound that has scarred people, mostly women, for centuries. Heal the Witch Wound is a witchcraft healing book with feminist overtones, guiding modern witches on the path of healing their own witch wound. The book unfolds in three parts. Part one journeys back into the burning times. Part two is rooted in the present moment and explores the most common signs and symptoms of the witch wound. And part three branches into the bright and brilliant future, offering an abundance of practices, both magical and mundane, to help heal the witch wound. And that includes step-by-step rituals, exercises, journal prompts, affirmations, visualizations, and other tools. Author Celeste Larson is a pagan witch, writer, ritualist, and esoteric business owner. She authors the blog Mage by Moonlight, where she writes about a range of esoteric topics, including folk magic, Norse paganism, polytheism, animism, ancestor veneration, ritual practice, magical self-healing, and more. 
Originally from Texas, Celeste currently resides in beautiful County Cork, Ireland. So go ahead and read her new book, Heal the Witch Wound, or check out her website at www.magebymoonlight.com or at Mage by Moonlight on social media. Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab is a specialty fragrance house currently celebrating its 20th year, now based in Philadelphia. Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab specializes in formulating body and household blends with a dark, romantic, gothic tone. And over the years, they've collaborated with so many of my heroes, including Neil Gaiman, Guillermo del Toro, and the Jim Henson Company. They continually return to inspirations drawn from history, mythology, literature, pop culture, and fine art, and they have a sister store called Twilight Alchemy Lab that creates oils blended and consecrated specifically for use in witchcraft and ritual magic. Keep up with their latest seasonal perfume releases by looking them up on social media. And Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab also now has a YouTube channel where they share scent reviews, announcements, and original video art. Perfume archives and customer reviews going back many years can be found at the fan-run bpal.org web forum. And of course, you can order all of Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab's decadent perfumes, oils, and more at blackphoenixalchemylab.com. Would you like even more Witch Wave? Do you wish you could hear from me and my other bewitching guests on a weekly basis? Then come join us on Patreon, where you'll get bi-weekly bonus Witch Wave Plus episodes, ad-free Witch Wave episodes, and detailed show notes for all. Rewards for some tiers also include magical merch and contests where you can win witchly prizes each month, as well as early heads up about my workshops before they sell out. And all backers get access to our exclusive digital coven, where I lead monthly online rituals and where you can connect to a community of other wonderful witch wave witches around the world. So head on over to patreon.com slash witchwave and sign up. It's a fabulous way to get more magic in your life and to support the show. Thank you so much. Welcome back to the Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with Andrea Gutierrez Glick. So we brought up this phrase, intergenerational trauma or transgenerational trauma, And this is something that gets talked about a lot. I sort of made like a glib little joke about us being Jewish and having that trauma, but like that's real shit, right? And I know there's this whole line or branch of science called epigenetics where people are discovering literally that trauma is inherited at the cellular level to some degree or the genetic level to some degree. I'm also really interested in how that overlaps with like generational curses and witchcraft. I think they can be sort of metaphors for each other, perhaps. But what is your thinking about intergenerational trauma? What is your understanding of that? And and what do you want people to know about it? Yeah, just like with everything we were talking about with anxiety, it's so nature, it's so nurture. So PTSD also has a heritability rate. So even if your caring parent or whoever carried you wasn't experiencing the trauma when you were in utero, whatever they had been through before they were pregnant with you or you were born, that can get passed to you. Certain genes get turned on because of trauma that your parents experienced, your grandparents experienced. And then in the here and now, if you have certain adverse childhood experiences, certain genes can get turned on in childhood. So epigenetics also talks about your lifetime and how your earliest years or your experience in utero turned on certain genes or not. And then you also have the nurture component, which I'll use my own family as an example, which is you have, you know, until the generation before me, you have many, many, many generations of experiencing unpredictable, chaotic violence. And so what does that do to how parents parent, right? There's a lot of anxiety. 
there's a lot of fear in the house. And so the parenting, the child rearing is impacted by that stress and trauma. And so the child is not only inheriting certain genes or having certain genes turned on, but the way that they're being raised is deeply impacted by the generational trauma, even if the bad thing isn't happening anymore. So we hear this a lot. And I'll just jump in to say, and I think that's very relevant for like adopted children. My husband has two siblings who are adopted. And I know that sometimes his sister will make a joke about like, oh, well, that's not my genes about like his family. But she was still raised by the same mom and dad that he was raised. And so their trauma still affected her, even though it wasn't at the genetic level. Right. Am I understanding that? Yeah, through the nurturing of the parents. So we learn a lot from who we need to be in the world, what is expected of us, what's safe, what's not safe from our parents. And so if we have traumatized caregivers or they had traumatized caregivers, so on and so forth, those legacies get passed down, even if, again, they're not relevant to our lives. So that's how we can really identify a legacy burden Mm -hmm. or a generational burden is the thing I'm scared of or the thing that is triggering me it isn't relevant to the conditions of my life. So for me, I have a lot of food scarcity stuff. I'm very privileged. I never actually had to deal with that reality in my lifetime, but it is something that my grandparents and every generation before them dealt with. So when I'm having a hard time throwing something away that is rotten, or I'm having a stressful experience at the grocery store, feeling like I have to buy more of something that I need, I just take a second and I'm like, is this me or is this generational? Mm. And it is generational. It doesn't reflect my current conditions. So it's really helpful in slowing down and not repeating some of those behaviors so that I don't pass that on to the next generation because they don't need to carry that anymore. And for a lot of people, that is still their reality. And so they don't have the privilege of getting to move on from that burden. But generally speaking, There's a lot of stuff that we carry from our grandparents and our great-grandparents and so on that really doesn't serve a purpose in our life anymore. Mm. So how do we get rid of it? (laughs) I mean, I know you can't actually answer that in, you know, the final (laughs) few minutes that we have, but have you seen that it is possible to override these things, to overcome these things? I mean, one of the phrases that I really love, we talk a lot about post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm someone who lives with that because of some really difficult stuff I went through as a younger person. But I was recently introduced to the phrase post-traumatic growth, that Mm -hmm. like trauma can also grow us. It doesn't have to only keep us, you know, smaller or calcified or scared, right? I just wonder how you feel about all that. Absolutely. I mean, I feel like I have so many clients in their meaning making. So the first phase of trauma treatment is stabilization. The second phase is processing. And then the final phase is integration. And part of integration is 100% looking at, well, what has this done for me? Not that it should have happened because that's never the answer, but given what I've been through, how am I different in ways that are actually really helpful in my life or make me different than other people or have helped me find this person in my life or this career or this connection to something that I wouldn't have found otherwise. I am who I am today because of this. So it's really that weaving our traumas into our story of ourselves versus it being the hottest topic, right? Or the headline and more just like a page in our story. That's right there. That's what trauma therapy is. How do we unburden ourselves from generational burdens, I think is really having a lot of appreciation and compassion for how those traits kept our ancestors safe. And there can be a lot of, again, connection with ourselves and those who came before us, that appreciation versus carrying that heaviness. So in appreciating, we are kind of releasing at the same time. Like, I see how this kept y'all safe, and I also don't need to carry it anymore. That is so beautifully said. And what it brings up for me is I've gotten much deeper into my own ancestral magic during the pandemic, suddenly I just got really into genealogy. I got way more into Jewish folk magic and talking to my ancestors, getting to know them. And like I said, witchcraft is not a replacement for therapy. And yet I found it really healing to speak to some of my ancestors and to like thank them for so many of the gifts that I've inherited, but also let them know like, you don't have to worry about 
X, Y, Z anymore. So you don't have to make me worry about it anymore. And it's been so incredible to blend these different methods together along with that therapy I'm doing with my therapist. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And I use EMGR, but I also use internal family systems therapy with clients. And so we can identify parts of us that have kind of taken on these burdens from other generations or from trauma that we've experienced. So like for me, how this shows up in my life is I have this managerial part who wants to keep me working all the time, (sighs) uh, managing other people. There's no time for rest. I mean, literally my dad to this day works six days a week and like, he's almost going to be 70. You know, like this is very generational. And I have taken that on. And there are certain parts of me that carry these burdens, given the opportunity, they want to do something else, right? The manager part of me is tired. Like she wants to rest. She wants to be in nature. She wants to connect with my partner and my family. And so when I like slow down, I'm like, who is driving the bus of Andrea right now? Is it me, my core self, or is it this manager who I'm not demonizing because she took this on from what I had been through and what other generations had been through. And so helping her release that versus like shunning her, trying to get rid of her. So that's a really helpful frame to definitely to think about like, okay, what part of us is still playing out this stuff and how can we really help them let it go? Not just us, but the part of us that took that on. Ah, that is so helpful. And I'm making all these connections in my own life, which, you know, I don't need to make everyone listen to my (laughs) own like therapeutic processing. But but I really appreciate that. And I need to like definitely after we get off mic, unpack that a little bit more. That's really exciting. So even though we can't speak to every listener's specific experience or specific stress or hardship, what is universal right now is, you know, we're living in this time of political tumult. We're living in this time of racism and anti-Semitism and homophobia and transphobia and sexism, you know, which I will say always been there in this country, but it's roaring back in a very clear public way. Climate change, financial stress and economic stress right now. There's a fucking lot, let alone the three years and counting of this pandemic, which has been absolutely traumatizing. So I wondered if, as we're starting to wind down, if there are any, I don't know, bits of advice or wisdom that you feel called to share with people in terms of how they can cope, how they can start to feel a little bit better today and in the days to come. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go back to those words that I was using earlier about like, what do we do? How do we get through this? What is like the balm to this reality that so many of us live in? And I really believe that it is about community and compassion and freedom. Those are words that I use all the time in my practice. I use them with myself to be like, how can I get one or all of those things in my life right now? And that can mean so many things, but can we slow that down? Community, compassion, and freedom. Okay, good. Love it. Carry on. Yeah, that's it. I mean, that's being able to be in relationship with others. Community can also mean community with parts of ourselves. It can mean community with the natural world. It can mean micro communities of our neighborhood or other witches or, you know, being in queer and trans community and then having compassion for the way that our body has survived, how it's keeping us safe right now. Compassion for our previous generations, compassion for our anxiety part, all of that is so useful versus us continuing to internalize the voice of the oppressor and really shame those parts of us. And then freedom in our body, political freedom, sexual freedom, spiritual freedom. How can we really tap in to one of those or all of those experiences? What makes your body feel free, right? Because what is happening with all of these things that you named is we're feeling trapped and controlled and unsafe. A glimmer is the opposite of a trigger. It's like, well, how do we feel the opposite of what the world is making us feel Mm -hmm. right now? And that's different for everybody, but I think it's huge. And what I think therapy's role is, is helping us have more of those experiences outside of the therapeutic office. So processing through trauma so that it's less scary to connect with other people. So it feels more possible to be compassionate to ourselves. And so that when we are feeling freedom in our bodies, we're able to connect with that sensation instead of being cut off at the neck and really not feeling what that's like physically. Mm. So just to unpack that even more. So that's what you think therapy is 
the most effective at doing is to help people almost like get out of their own way from preventing them from feeling those things or engaging in those things. Because it feels to me like a lot of what prevents us is like this self-protective thing. And those self-protective behaviors, like you said, they come from a good place. You know, they care about us. They are trying to keep us safe. But often they come down when they're not necessary or there are ways that we can override them and not let them control us so much. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. And those protectors, they don't want to be protecting. They want to be doing something else. They also want to feel free. They also want to feel connection. So when we work with them, instead of overriding them, I'm going to force myself into feeling good in my body today, even though these protective parts of me are screaming like this isn't safe. We want to help those parts of us come along for the ride of healing versus bulldozing past them so that we can get to the good stuff. And when people are having experiences in therapy, where they're feeling completely overwhelmed and like it is too much, it's probably also because these protective parts have been ignored. That's where we really want to get started. And then once everybody's kind of on board with the healing, a lot can happen. Yeah. One of the little like things I jotted down in my notes here is just, I think a lot about how people often they become as they get older Not all people, certainly, but some people, they can get hardened, they can get bitter, they can calcify. And how my goal as I get older is to stay more expansive and soft and supple and more open. And just in terms of like those kind of movement words, like fluidity or a witchcraft word, shape shifting, you know, all of these words that invite in this more elasticity and so on. And I wonder if that feels physically relevant to the work that you do? If by moving our bodies, it also helps us move through some of these hardening, self-protective shields that come down. Definitely getting the body involved for sure. But I think that really is also one of the purposes of therapy or trauma therapy is getting unstuck, right? Like the parts of us that have dug their heels in, it's not safe to be in relationship It's not safe to be curious about the world. It's not safe to be self-compassionate because I have to be so on guard. That is that like hardening, right? And so when we do soften up to different parts of us or even to other people in our lives, we're able to feel more human. Mm, 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 mm. Beautiful. That feels like a good place to stop, even though I want to talk to you for 17 more (laughs) hours. Andrea, I know that people are going to want to learn how to connect with you. What is the best way for people to continue learning from you? Absolutely. So folks can find me on my website, which is andreaglick.com, on Instagram at Somatic Witch. If you are living in the state of Missouri, which is unceded and occupied Osage and Sioux territory, I'm accepting clients potentially in the fall or the winter. And then I have workshops on my website. I'm frequently getting to teach at really cool places. So if you follow me, uh, that can be a really nice way to connect as well. How fabulous. And I'll just shout out your blog again because some of the articles that you wrote were really helpful for me and really beautifully and sensitively written too. So thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for your time and for just sharing with such an open heart It feels like such a silly thing to say, like, you're so articulate, but you're taking these really big concepts and making them understandable. And so that's a real gift that you have, too. So thank you for sharing all of those gifts with me today. Thank you, Pam. Absolutely. Thank you for your thoughtful questions and for seeing my Virgo energy of like, let's just take all these big ideas and really make them easy and understandable and digestible. That's deep, deep in there for me. (laughs) I love that. I love that. I love having you on the witch wave and I hope you'll come back again. Thank you so much, Andrea. That's it for the show. Thank you again to Andrea Gutierrez Glick for sharing her therapeutic magic with me. Do you have questions, feedback, need some witchly advice, or just want to share something magical that happened to you recently? Drop us an email at witchwavepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you, and you just might make it on the Witch Wire. The Witch Wave is a phantasmophile production written and produced by me, Pam Grossman. This episode was recorded and edited by Josh Wilcox and myself. Our theme music is the song Hand and Eye by Lycanthia. 
Our new Witchwave logo was designed by Thunderwing. Special thanks go to Matt Freeman, Lara Amtal, and Cece Pascal. You can check out information about this and other episodes on our website and now buy Witchwave merch at witchwavepodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app and give us lots and lots of sparkly stars. It really, truly makes a difference and helps other people find the show. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WitchwavePod, and you can check out my witch emoji for iPhone by going to witchemoji.com or downloading it in the App Store. Please consider ordering my book, Witchcraft, and or picking up my book, Waking the Witch, which are both available everywhere now. And if you want more Witch Wave or you would just like to support the show, please join us over on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash witchwave. Thank you so much for listening. Witches are the future. I'll catch you next time on The Witch Wave.